I wanted to introduce Steve. Uh, he is uh, one of the original, and well, and we have Lore and who else did I see? Mike on the from the Winlink development team here. Uh, Steve is going to actually talk about uh, the share system and how it interoperates with Winlink and how we can get signed up, who it's available to, all that stuff. Um, he actually helped us in Snohomish County get our um, license, our shares license in about 24 hours. It was super complicated. Uh, fill out a piece of paper, send it to Steve. Boom, I, we got a license. Um, it was fantastic. So um, uh, certainly anybody that's eligible uh, should certainly consider it. And Steve will tell you why. And if you're ready, I'll give it to you, Steve. Okay. Uh, I, I have a lot of competition tonight. I know that. Uh, especially in your neck of the woods. Uh, what uh, I would uh, like to say is that uh, it was when Scott asked me to do this, I had really uh, reservations because usually uh, uh, when I give a presentation, it's to people who are there because of their uh, love for or interest in emergency communications. And I thought about how am I going to deal with this with a, a mixed group of uh, highly technical and sophisticated Westerners. So, so, so uh, this will have a little different slant than the normal presentation would have for me anyway. And so uh, I want to get got another, one of the things I'll say about it, it's very busy. It's busier than a presentation should be um, because I want it to be able to stand on its own. Uh, Okay, so anybody that wants a copy of this obviously can have it. Uh, also, uh, uh, perhaps I could put this in context uh, uh, so that it, uh, what I'm trying to do is put emergency services that amateur radios can be involved with in a context that could interest and should interest everybody. Okay, so let me see how I do this. Stop the video. Start the screen share. Bingo. Okay. Get rid of that. All right. Now, uh, I've been a ham since 1955. Uh, and most of the time I spent uh, my youth. Uh, on CW. In, in 1986, I was at Dayton and went to a ready dinner on a Saturday night. And uh, I met Vic Poor, who was co author of the single chip microprocessor and author of something called AppLink, which is the predecessor for WinLink uh, before Windows 3.1. And AppLink uh, was the Amptor Packet Link, which took packet communities. Uh, from New York to Los Angeles and link them together with uh, Amtor, which was the uh, similar to the commercial Cytor, which was the, the thing of the day. Uh, and that started me uh, from then on uh, in dealing with this subject uh, of Winlink and AppLink and uh, storm forward uh, email over or storm forward messaging over amateur radio. And I've been doing that now since about 1986. Uh, <clears throat> I am the immediate past president of uh, the Amateur Radio Safety Foundation, which I said earlier funds Winlink. Uh, Lore is now the president. I guess they got tired of me. Uh, currently, uh, I'm on the board of the Amateur Radio Safety Foundation and I'm the Winlink administrator for the Winlink development team. Uh, I am the Shares Winlink Administrator and chair a working group called the Winlink Working Group for the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I'm on the FEMA Region 4 Regional Emergency Communication Coordinating Working Group uh, on the OXCOM Working Group. I chair that committee. The RECWIC is a congressionally mandated uh, uh, organization that or group that uh, allow state governments, county governments, tribal or tribal governments, and uh, non-government organization to uh, in critical infrastructure partners like Microsoft to feedback information so that FEMA knows 
what it needs to do in order to assist these states and these other agencies. Uh, I'm a member of the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency Communications Unit, um, and I'm a Williamson County, Tennessee Reserve. Uh, that's what I do with my spare time. You know, when <clears throat> we rely on a uh, normal communication, public safety, land mobile infrastructure for emergency services, it can lead to a lot of issues. Uh, Laura can attest to that in North Carolina. Uh, things happen to the external infrastructure and amateur radio is key or set up key to assist with uh, that type of a, an emergency, especially as a first response. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen. I mean, we can think about tsunamis and we can think about uh, earthquakes and we can think about uh, terrorism power grid outages, who would ever have known a year ago that we would be in the condition we're in now with this uh, coronavirus? I mean, we just don't know. So how, the, the real question for an amateur radio operator and an emergency services personnel is, how do you coordinate any large network restoration without normal communications? I mean, when the power grid goes out, the internet goes out, Landline goes out, cell phones, satellite phones, land mobile radio networks, in other words, public safety, they all depend on really vulnerable infrastructure, which depends, of course, on power, water, fuel, people. So how do you deal with that? Uh, if you think about the amateur radio, why should all this matter to amateur radio operators? Well, the first statement in the FCC Part 97 amateur regulations deals with the basis and purpose for amateur radio, and it deals with, particularly, with respect to providing emergency communications. Granted, this was written a long time ago, and it's still applicable today. So the FCC, you know, we've got a real double-edged sword here, because the FCC says, and they just got through saying recently that Emergency communications is a very important justification for the existence of our spectrum. But we have such severe restrictions in Part 97, mostly from uh, organizations that have been gone for 25 and 30 years. Uh, AT&T High Seas Network lobbied very heavily to limit what we can and can't do. And they're just the beginning. So we have very limited spectrum and very and absolutely no channelization, meaning that you know an emergency is gonna happen when there's a worldwide contest taking place. It's just life. So we have data transfer restrictions, the symbol rate rule, which uh, was had a purpose, no longer does with our more modern orthotical frequency division multiplex protocols like PACTOR, et cetera. Vera, we, we don't uh, need that symbol rate rule. It's just, it just keeps us from moving forward into the rest of the world with digital communication. Well, the digital technology is something that uh, we understand and the attorneys now at the FCC, uh, I don't think they really understand or care. So there's no specific MCOM training, no emergency communication training required in part 97. There's no mention of NIMS ICS, which is an absolute requirement for a authority having jurisdiction to utilize amateur radio operators or any volunteer resource. So when you think about amateur radio, people think more of about it a public service than a real emergency service. So my question is, does that diminish our value? Uh, and should we really be threatened? I'll give you a recent example is this uh, in two, 2019, December, the FCC, if you look at the ARL article, the URL is under it, the FCC formally adopts proposal to remove amateur radio three gigahertz band. Well, the 115th Congress made a mandatory, uh, uh, 
you can put the gavel down on new spectrum for fixing the mobile wireless broadband use. And here we are to eight, 12, 20, and I look in the website, uh, ARL website, US Department of Defense to share 3450, 3550 megahertz with 5G commercial operations. They've taken it, it's gone. What else? Well, I'm looking at I, IEEE and there is an article, Wall Street tries shortwave radio to make high frequency trades across the Atlantic. Financial firms hope radio can execute trades faster than fiber optic cables. Well, they're using spread spectrum. And you guys know spread spectrum takes a lot of spectrum. Well, who has it? I think the biggest problem with amateur radio keeping uh, itself important to the rest of the world is indifference. You know, Bill Cross, who was the FCC amateur division, retired on April 1st, 2015, got married, and he's never been replaced. Uh, the man who was in charge of the amateur division and the wireless bureau left in January this year, Scott Stone, he's been replaced three times. The people that are there don't care about amateur radio, in my opinion. Let me preface this as just my opinion. But my opinion is based on what I see um, and what I hear and what I read, just like everybody else's. So we got requests from the FCC from various sources on all sides of any pertinent issue, and they still remain in limbo. The symbol rate rule that the ARL requested that, the, that Bill Cross agreed to is still in limbo. 99% of the U.S. amateur radio population doesn't bother to get involved with FCC issues. Very few people comment. But I mean, most of us do care, but we don't participate. And I'm thinking maybe it's our age. Maybe we're just complacency. You know, it's our complacency. Look at our average age. You know, 10 years from now, I'm 78. What will be so, so what? So is that the attitude we take? I don't know. I do know that there's a pretty exciting service uh, that we can become involved in that will do more for our survival than any of us could do commenting, including the ARL. <clears throat> and that is to become involved with an important element of our society through federal, state, local governments and our NGO critical infrastructure partners. And that's a shared resource high frequency radio program that is put forth by the Department of Homeland Security. So SHARES is what it's called, was evolved from the national communication system, which no longer exists. It was a Cold War warning system, such as Conrad and other federal agency only systems. And it's changed now and become an all hazard contingency emergency communication option for civil authorities like um, uh, Scott's uh, County and your state, Washington and Oregon and Alaska and Idaho in your region, your FEMA region and California and the rest of the states. It handles all civil authorities and their NGO critical infrastructure partners at all levels, county, state, federal, some large cities are involved. Corporations such as uh, Federal Express, AT&T, has got 54 locations on this network. So SHARES is now under uh, what's called, as of a couple of months ago, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA. <clears throat> CISA is the nation's risk advisor. And it works with partners to defend against today's threats and collaborates to build more secure and resilient infrastructure for our future. Uh, it is a very effective part of Homeland Security. So what's the opportunity for a civil authority and their critical infrastructure partner? Well, it's negligible cost. It's a proven option. It takes 24 hours to get involved, as uh, Scott says, uh, and it attracts volunteer resources, hams. I've got to say here at the outset that there have been many deployments in amateur radio uh, that has, in shares that amateur radio has been involved with. 
when shares went to Puerto Rico after the hams left. Uh, they had eight, 11 people that went to Puerto Rico to uh, provide contingency communications for the FEMA joint field offices, three joint field offices. Two of them were federal employees. All of them were hams. I would say 90% of the shares activity are volunteer resources working with uh, civil authorities and their critical infrastructure partners. That's a great thing because it gives us an opportunity to really make a difference. So what are the opportunities for the amateur radio uh, operator and what does our government provide for us? How do we approach the opportunities and what are the benefits? And so how do we get started? Uh, CISA shares is a service for civil authorities at all levels of government. Um, it's available to hospitals, no matter how large or small, counties. It's available to uh, member agencies uh, uh, to provide an opportunity to, for amateur radio involvement. <clears throat> there are certain criteria that uh, I know are important, uh, like dressing professionally, uh, like uh, not wearing your blue and orange badges, leaving all of that amateur radio paraphernalia at the door and entering with a skill set only uh, and a willingness to li listen and learn. That's very important. HF communication expertise and knowledge uh, through the National Incident Management S System really does bring amateur radio to the table. And they're not difficult courses. I mean, Look at it, they're federal government online courses. Today they're gonna be, uh, because of the coronavirus, uh, it's gonna be very difficult to take uh, classroom advanced courses. So I don't know what's gonna happen there. But knowing where to check into an incident, knowing that uh, your role is functional and not operational, that you're not gonna command anybody uh, is important. There are certain parameters that we have to learn, but once we learn them, we become valuable. And the more we utilize, of course, the more valuable we become. Tomorrow, uh, the FEMA Region 4, Reckwick, of eight states uh, in the Southeast um, that have uh, weather-related issues on an annual basis are having a communication exercise where they're going to take statewide trunking systems, one of the largest in the world, and tie it to the other statewide systems uh, and bridge them together um, along with uh, communicating via WinLink, communicating via the uh, FEMA National Radio Emergency Radio System and through satellite trunking. So WinLink is right there. Uh, with amateurs. Everybody that's operating that is an amateur. Now, some of them are state EMA uh, directors and statewide interoperability coordinators, and uh, some of them are uh, communication managers for, for these states, but they're all hands. So let me look. Look, this is the uh, share is in the CISA organization which is uh, equivalent to, uh, in the hierarchy, it, 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 it and FEMA are on the same level. Um, and CISA recently migrated from a headquarters component through the Department of Homeland Security to a fully operational component, which gives it a lot more autonomy and a lot less political interference. And I can attest to that already. It really made a difference. The SHARE's mission is to support the mission of its member agencies. It has no real mission of its own other than to be there to support whatever it is that's needed by its member agencies. The purpose of SHARE's is to support interoperable emergency communication by radio for national security and emergency preparedness. There are approximately 3,000 participants in this program. It uses multiple agency stations, shared resources. Uh, it uses shared channels and other agency federal channels. For example, SHARES has 145 
HF channels from the NTIA. Other agencies supply 218 additional HF channels and one VHF channel with more pending. Shares Winlink has 85, we're actually 87 now, specific channels, exclusive quotes, unquote, as exclusive can be on HF radio, uh, specific channels. There's no harmonically related channels. There's no gaps between uh, spectrum. It's a very effective. Okay. Well, so why shares? Well, it's got proven components. It's got we they they, they use single sideband voice with a and without ALE. Uh, Wednesday morning, if you want to check into a shares net and you're a shares member. It's there for you to check into. Um, the Winlink radio email system is uh, on exclusive, as I say, federal channels. Um, it's a much different system uh, than uh, the ham system, but I'll get into that. It's a true emergency service, Shares is. It promotes volunteer participation. When you remember that the amateur service is not a true ongoing emergency service. Uh, every time we need Pactor 4, we need to get a special temporary authority. Ridiculous, but we have to do it, uh, and we always get it. The amateur service is a public service with severe FCC Part 97 restrictions that can only be breached under very extreme circumstances, uh, the formal RACES program, which has not been used in quite a while. So no FCC Part 90 acceptance hardware restrictions for agencies that are under FCC jurisdiction. For example, if Scott Honecker wants to use an amateur radio because he's more familiar with it than a $5,000 CODAN or whatever, uh, he can do so. He can use an opened up ham equipment. It's a lot less expensive, it's more flexible, and the volunteers are already familiar with it. He doesn't have to take it in the back room to program it or deal with a union. Shares doesn't require any commun communication infrastructure. Well, you can do HF radio out of a rowboat. It's interoperable among civil authorities and their critical infrastructure partners. And that's very key. That interoperability is very key. So for the income trained hand volunteers, what can shares provide in addition to what's already provided on the amateur spectrum. I keep talking about that. Let's get into it. You can't cons con obscure data or the content or the meaning of data on the amateur radio bands. Anything you send out is open to the public. You can encrypt, you can password protect, you can do whatever you need to do on the share system. Uh, there's no symbol rate limit. Uh, there's no uh, limit on data rates. Uh, the agency personnel are allowed to operate. For example, you don't have to be an amateur radio operator to operate shares. So if I'm in a hospital and I need to get on the radio and operate, I don't have to wait for some licensed amateur radio volunteer to arrive. I can get started. There's no pecuniary interest rule. If I'm a Microsoft employee and I'm being paid and I start operating amateur radio, uh, emergency or not, I'm in trouble because I'm not allowed to operate and receive compensation for it at all. There's no channelization on amateur radio. Like I say, emergencies usually take place during contests or field day. <laughs> or some other busy period, or when, the pro when there's a, a, a storm, uh, a solar storm. So there is exclusive channelization on shares. It's the much expanded uh, HS spectrum with less propagation issues. And like I say, the interoperability with other communications resources that the government uses is paramount. So think about the federal department. These are, these are the things that shares interfaces with, federal departments and agencies. 
civil authorities at all levels of government, critical infrastructure, key resource providers, telecommunications companies, power, common carrier hospitals, medevac coordinators, transportation, and much more. It also deals with national and regional disaster relief organizations, Saturn, uh, Southern Baptist Disaster Relief, um, the American Red Cross, etc. And it also deals with state and national guard, whether they're under Title 10 military federalized or whether they're under Title 32 working for your governor. I thought I'd throw this in since you're up there near Alaska. Uh, Shares has an opportunity to use the 5.17675 megahertz Alaska Emergency Channel. Uh, it can you it can talk to activated racy stations. Um, it could talk to amateur radio stations on the five amateur secondary five megahertz channels, and through Winlink, it can talk to anybody it wants. I can be a shares member and use my shares call sign and send a message to K4CJX on the handbands, and K4CJX can pick up that Winlink message and return a message to me using K4CJX on the handbands to uh, myself uh, using my shares call sign and shares frequency. I can encrypt, uh, but I can send a message to amateur radio and vice versa. And also, uh, lately there's been a lot going on with non-US stations for disaster response coordination. Uh, the Federation of Micronesia is, uh, which we have a compact with, the United States, is going to set up short soon as we can uh, get out to set it up uh, with the coronavirus, coronavirus issue. Uh, they are going to set up uh, something for their Department of Education and their various islands, and three of the top frequencies are going to be provided for the Department of Defense. There's also a lot more going on out of Hawaii to the Pacific regarding the Department of Defense, all through the shares resource. That's got to have an impact on what we are able to do in terms of survival for amateur radio. So what's the role of a member agency? Keeping in mind that shares does not solicit individuals or amateur radio. Amateur radio get, operators get involved as a communicate as a voluntary communication resource through their member agencies, only through their member agencies. So shares can help obtain station call signs for agencies, like I did for Scott. He mentioned it uh, recently. It took 24 hours for him to get his call sign. Probably 24 hours and one minute he was on the air. <laughs> uh, Ham call signs are not used in shares channels as station identification. There are no operator licenses or call signs. There are station location call signs. So uh, let's say that an agency has five locations. It would have a call sign and a point of contact for each location, regardless of who's operating the station. That's up to the member agency. So to participate, the agency's only requirement is to keep the equipment ready and their operators trained. And they should expand their service for the sake of interoperability by enlisting other civil authorities and NGOs. You're, you're, the state of Washington is very good at that. So is the state of California. They coordinate and manage Qualified volunteers, which I have to say are 99 and 9 tenths percent hams with a little NIMS training and a great attitude. The price is really right. The cost of a complete amateur station is less than one single Motorola P25 ham held if you're using modified amateur equipment. Most agencies have zillions of handhelds in their cash to hand out. You're asking for less than, you're asking for hardly any money at all. NTI allows the operation of non-amateur, I mean, of a non 
part 90, part 90 FCC, part 90 type accepted equipment because there is no FCC involved. And the volunteers know how to use it. Also, if you're an agency and you're scratching your head about this, many hams you'd lot love using their own equipment. I mean, how many times have you seen uh, an amateur radio organization with a, a vehicle that uh, uh, has a, it's a trailer or a, an ambulance or something that uh, they built out? The question is, do they have a relationship with their agency and will it be used? It's a big question. So what's the role of the volunteer? Volunteers are managed by their member agencies, as I said. Volunteers can be used to operate shared stations, which frees the agency staff to do work that can't be done by volunteers. As I said before, you don't have to have a commercial or a handmade, you don't have to have any license. Member agencies are responsible for determining the qualification and who uses their stations. In my opinion, um, and it's been true so far, agencies really require some NIMS training online classroom courses. Uh, and the online courses, of course, don't take any time at all. The classroom courses are great. Uh, before this virus hit and you attended a, 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 one of the classroom courses, you were uh, team building and working with and learning next to the people that you would be serving in these agencies because they're in there taking the course with you. So you develop the relationship. They know your capabilities. They know who you are. The time of an emergency is not to run up with your handheld and get acquainted. Okay, so I wanna uh, again emphasize the importance of the volunteer role. When the ARRL force of 22 uh, left Puerto Rico, um, the uh, FCC Public Safety and Homeland Security Division uh, had some questions about uh, their effectiveness. So they put out public comments and the agencies that dealt with the 2017 hurricane season, which was mainly Maria, uh, answered these questions. And this is the response from the big gorilla the Department of Homeland Security, the National Coordinating Center for Communications, which is uh, eventually the parent organization for shares. And the FCC asked the question, to what extent were response efforts facilitated by amateur radio operators? And the answer was, in addition to the direct services provided by amateur radio operators, the indirect services of technology development, operator training, and support of the SHARES WinLink network, among others, makes amateur radio an indispensable component of our national capability to prepare for, protect against, respond to, and recover from mitigation against all hazards. I mean, what could you ask for more than that? I mean, it's like they're asking the FCC to do something. So the second question is, going forward, should efforts be made to increase the use of amateur radio service in connection with planning, testing, and provisions for emergency response and emergency and recovery communication. And the Department of Land Security said, we ask the commission to review those aspects of part 97 of their rules relating to emergency communications, including operational and technical restrictions, which limit utilization of new technologies. Bingo. Believe me, they heard that. They might not have heard my comments that I wrote in, but I know they heard that. And they're hearing it from more and more from many levels of uh, uh, disaster planning and communication throughout all levels of our government and our corporate environment. So the question is, do we have an obligation to become a little bit involved in this subject? It's a lot of fun for me. It's a lot of fun for Laura. Uh, obviously, Scott likes it. Um, I don't know who else is interested in it, but it's wide open and it makes a difference. So there are scheduled nets, as I said. There's digital nets. There's ALE's voice nets. Uh, there's a digital Winlink hybrid radio email system. Uh, that system, by the way, um, well, let me wait on that. Uh, 
there's HF alerting, there's low frequency alerting. There's collaboration with these different working groups uh, by webinar. The groups, there's an interoperability working group, which any SHARES member can attend. Uh, it's a opportunity to learn uh, about emergency communication related issues and highly technical issues dealing with HF radio. Uh, let you see what the quote big boys uh, are interested in, what DOD is doing, what DHS is doing. Uh, don't forget you're under a non-disclosure when you join chairs. There's a WinLink SysOps working group. There are over a hundred radio message server uh, SysOps. Uh, there's, I think, 11 in the state of Washington. Uh, but there are a there are hundred SysOps and um, a lot of times the some of these people need help. Uh, they want to meet other people to see what they're doing, what their agency is doing, how well the entire system's working. It's a great opportunity to deal. And by the way, a radio message server is a funnel into uh, the Amazon cloud, the Amazon AWS. It is a conversion process and a funnel straight into it. It's a star network, like a, the Amazon cloud is a, the hub of a bicycle wheel, for example. At the end of each spoke going out toward the tire is a radio message server. So they all are redundant with each other. They all are the same. Um, and so you can put a message in one, take it out on another because the messages are actually not held on the radio message server. Case number one. Case number two, don't forget we're working with the cybersecurity protectorate. So they have, they, their attitude is, we don't want you if you have to use the internet. So there is a separate, uh, complete process by which there is no internet involved. And each radio message server becomes to the end user, becomes a large mesh network. And through heuristics and propagation algorithms, uh, the message that I send, if I want to send a message from here to Hawaii and I s put it on a local server, uh, a local radio server, that server knows where it needs to send that message based on the time of day, et cetera, in order to get it to Oahu EMA. The difference is, is that each RMS has a message pickup point. So as an end user, I have to decide which two radio message servers I want to use is my pickup point. And uh, so <clears throat> there's also a, a, an organization called the Combined Programs Working Group, which takes these items up above and um, deals with them uh, as, a, as a working group. Uh, low frequency learning, high frequency learning, ALE growth, uh, the, the SysOps group for the radio email network, et cetera. There's a lot to do if you wanna do it and get involved. And if you don't, you just wait for your agency to call you. <laughs> These are some of the weekly nets. Every Wednesday, um, the uh, Pacific, West Pacific, Western net, 1300 to 1330 Eastern uh, Daylight Time. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's a net down there called QSEC, which is a United States uh, Earthquake Consortium. And that is a uh, somewhat federally funded organization to handle the new Madrid fault on my part of the country on the other side of the Mississippi, but it works in conjunction with USGS. Uh, uh, the USGS, we just, uh, you, I don't know whether anybody knows this or not, but we just put a template form, an HTML form that mimics exactly what the uh, did you feel it form looks like. So if you feel an earthquake or there's an earthquake and you don't feel it, the U.S. Uh, worldwide, the uh, USGS, the United States Geological Survey, they want to know whether or not you felt that earthquake. And they ask some very various questions. You put that in WinLink Express. If you don't have internet and you're in the middle of some 
uh, calamity because of an earthquake, you can get to the database just like you would if you were on their website answering the question by posting that and sending it over radio into the internet. There's a California net, there's a Shares West net, uh, there's a automatic link establishment, which of course is continual. There's even a CW net. Shares takes care of its if it's volunteers. This is the AL, the new, the new ALE net. And if you look up there, there are now, this is this isn't current, there are a few up in the north and northwest, but not enough. If something happened in Seattle, obviously there's not enough. So that may be of interest to people. Um, I've already gone over this. Um, this is a very tightly controlled network, by the way. Uh, each radio message server scans five channels every 16 seconds, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If it goes down, we have a provision that drives the system operator nuts until it goes back up with text messages and email messages. Because this isn't hammered to radio. You don't turn it off when it lightnings and go home. Uh, it stays up, just like public safety stays up. And it's available to any SHARES member and their designated volunteer, 24 times 7 times 365. This is a picture of the uh, SHARES radio message servers. Notice a little H on there, which means that it works with or without the internet. It develops a MySQL database and holds messages if there is no internet. There are two in Puerto Rico. There are two in Hawaii. And if you notice uh, down there in uh, near McAllen, Texas, near Brownsville, Harlingen, Texas, uh, there's a red dot. This is the reason for the red dot. It went off the air. It got blown away physically. So the guy gets in there, he takes the equipment, he turns the modem on, puts on his client software. They had no power for, I think, 60 some hours. And he's able to communicate via email because he has WinLink to these other radio message servers that scan from three to 16, 17 megahertz. Okay, so how is it in your area? Well, Scott Dakers has done a great job uh, through uh, EMD. Uh, he's done a fabulous job in Washington. Look at the radio message servers. So if I'm in California, I've got it made. And if I'm in Montana, I've got it made. If I'm in Idaho, by the way, the Idaho uh, RMS you see there, one is the Idaho National Labs, the other is the state. The one on the left in Boise, I think is the state, if I'm not mistaken, EMA, the state EOC, and the uh, Idaho National Labs is over there and the other one. Uh, Cal OES has the one down there uh, near San Francisco, Sacramento and San Francisco. The H is missing because they're moving it. So it's being built slowly. This is not, this is a new system and the network is being built. The states are dedicated to providing more radio message servers on the share system and they're gonna need more volunteers. So you technical guys are gonna say, well, look, why are you talking about HF radio? This is the worst time in the last 11 years to be talking about HF radio. We're at a solar cycle minimum. I mean, well, things couldn't be worse. I've been through six of these. This is as bad and good. it's just like the rest of them. Propagation sucks. But there's a difference between amateur radio and shares. First of all, I can carefully choose very small increments to find the right frequency. So in order to make that point, the first time I gave this presentation, I don't remember when it was, I connected from Nashville, Tennessee to Hawaii directly 
on 14.8 megahertz using PACTOR-4, about 4,200, 4,300 miles, just to prove a point. And I did it when it was three or four megahertz above the theoretical maximum usable frequency. I had 130 watt on my end, 30 feet high, I mean 100 watts, 130 foot antenna with a counterpoise, 30 feet off the ground, and that's all I needed. And the reason is I was talking to another 100 watt station that was a vertical log periodic 600 feet high. I mean long, 140 feet high on a nine acre plot owned and operated by the Navy until recently given to shares through the Department of Homeland Security. There it is. You don't get that on amateur radio. That antenna is $250,000 uninstalled. It's got a negative noise floor of minus 130 dBm. It's isolated from just about everything else. And I don't know a ham that has an antenna like that that could receive emergency traffic. There are four, actually four antennas. 300 on each side. And uh, the lower left hand uh, picture is the solar power that powers the thing. And what you see on the right, of course, is what's inside. This is also dealing, the two antennas now are dealing with the Department of Defense in providing aid, mutual aid to islands in the Pacific that we have associations with. All run by hams. TEMA, Tennessee Emergency Management Agency. I thought I'd talk about it since I live here in Tennessee. There's the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency command bus, and there's Shares Windlink inside. There's a command vehicle with Shares Windlink inside. And there is Williamson County EMA. It's an old picture, but there's Shares Windlink inside both vehicles. Here's a picture of the Tennessee Department of Public Health Emergency Preparedness Shares a system. Now, do you need that out there? No. Do you have annual issues where you have tornadoes ripping through and uh, heavy duty weather? No. But that doesn't mean you're immune. And when something does happen, it sounds to me like it's gonna be pretty bad. It's certainly worth the cost and the effort to be prepared. This is the National Guard. They've got 14 locations, shares locations that they use for both Title 10 and Title 32, both for military and for support of the governor. This is a picture I took, just doesn't really have anything to do with you guys, unless you're in Alaska, I guess, but uh, some years ago, I was in a COMEL class with the with Bob Stevenson, who was the ESF2, the, the emergency communications manager for the Commonwealth of Kentucky, which is right above Tennessee. And we were about 90 miles from the northern border of Tennessee in a fire academy uh, on, a, on our first COMEL course. And uh, it started to snow. And he got a call saying, you have to come home immediately and get back to Lexington because we're expecting severe weather. Well, by the time he got home nine and a half hours later, um, the entire Western state was dead. There were no communication, no landline, no microwave, no satellite, no public radio. Nobody knew what was happening to the counties. The roads were almost just terrible. Kentucky's got hills. And what you're looking at is Bob Stevenson called back and asked the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency to send a recon vehicle into that area to see whether people were alive and what they needed. And so this is a one of many pictures that was taken 
buy one link and set back uh, via mobile on the non-amateur frequencies. So HF portable radio and antenna, 1400 bucks. Pactor 4 modem, 1400 bucks. Ability to send email when commercial communication systems fail, I think it's priceless. 